Leslie has agreed to do uh, to have an Ask Me Anything session, but with a caveat. Uh, we'll be talking about thinking mathematically, uh, so beyond the code. And uh, uh, Ask Me Anything session is a nice um, linking to the to the way Kutmish started yesterday. So there was the opening uh, by Thomas Petricek, who gave a very nice um, overview um, on the way that programming originated uh, intersection of topics like logic, art, electronic engineering, business, psychology. And uh, he actually discussed and introduced the different cultures of programming, um, including the hacker culture, managerial culture, engineering, artistic cultures, and of course, also the mathematical culture. And today, we in the session here, we will actually be focusing on this mathematical culture. Um, where programming is seen as a mathematical activity to some degree and uh, where formal methods are advocated. Um, so what do we actually mean when we uh, talk about thinking mathematically? What does this actually mean for us? Uh, well, I would actually like to start not about the mathematical point, but thinking above the code, uh, the above point. Uh, uh, I happen to believe that before you sit down and start building something, you should think. Now, in some circles, this is considered uh, um, silly that you, know, you should just sit down and start typing your code, but uh, I will assume that I don't have to convince people of the uh, need for thinking. And so what does thinking above the code mean? Well, there are two... Uh, Two things you need to decide uh, when you're going to write a piece of code and whether that piece of code is a database system or is just one you know little procedure somewhere inside your program you have to decide what it's supposed to do and how it's supposed to do it now thinking uh, by itself is not a very good idea if you don't write uh, as someone has said, writing is nature's way of showing you how sloppy your thinking is. And if you can't write something down, uh, you know, you think you understand it, and, but if you can't write it down, you don't understand it. So the question is, well, before I start writing a piece of code, you know, how much should I write? How much should I think about what it's supposed to do? Well, I mean, if this piece of code is to do something trivial, you know, copy an array from here to there, well, you know, maybe a sentence will do. Uh, a good rule of thumb is that the, what you write uh, should be enough to tell somebody who wants to use this piece of code everything they need to know. They shouldn't have to read the code in order to figure out what this uh, code you're writing is uh, going to do. And, um, and the reason for that is that, uh, well, you should think about odds are after you write this code, at some point you're going to want to go back and figure out what it, you know, what it's trying to do. And if you're like me, you know, it's two years ago, I have no idea of what it's supposed to be. And I really appreciate it if the person who wrote this code, especially if it's me, has actually written something saying what it's supposed to do. The and code is generally not a very good way of explaining what code is supposed to do. Uh, you know, you want to say you want it to copy this P array to over here. You don't want to have to say that by writing a piece of code that takes, you know, each element of the array and moves it over there. You should just be able to say this copies this array over to here. You know, it should be at a much higher level than the, the code you're writing. And then there's the question of how the code's supposed to do it. And Sometimes, you know, that's uh, trivial. There are lots of, lots of code that I write, uh, or used to write. Uh, you know, once I figured out what it's supposed to do, getting it to do it is pretty trivial. Uh, the hard part, and sometimes it is hard to really figure out exactly what it's supposed to do. On the other hand, sometimes it's not trivial. Sometimes there's an algorithm underneath there that needs to be understood, I mean, that it's not obviously correct. And the way to, uh, and it turns out that programming languages are not very good at describing algorithms. 
because algorithms should be at a higher level. You want to be able to say, oh, set this array equal to this array. Well, uh, if, uh, you know, most programming languages I know, you have to, the only way to say that is by writing a loop that copies from one to the other. And if I'm describing in the algorithm, I wanted that to be just, you know, something that you just do, you don't think about, have to think about. And so I'd like to think at some higher level than the code. Uh, I don't want to be constricted by having to give, you know, take all of these relevant details. Like I want to talk about some piece, you know, some code that's computing some uh, some number. Well, when I'm making work, worrying about the basic algorithm, I don't want to worry about overflow, for example. That's not an interesting part of the algorithm. So I want to be able to ignore that. Now again, to what you know, what I write it in. Uh, maybe I'll write it in English. Most of the code that I've described, even if there's something interesting that it does, I'll describe it in English and you know, perhaps a mathematical formula thrown in uh, to, to make my English a little bit more precise. Uh, but sometimes uh, writing more precisely is uh, helpful. And especially if you're gonna wanna use tools to check what you write then it's got to be written in a precise language. And programming like, since programming languages aren't the best way to think about algorithms, you don't, don't want to use a programming language just because uh, you want to check it. So that's, you know, what thinking above the code means. And mathematically, well, I think it's a good idea to understand to be able to think mathematically, because math is developed basically as a very rigorous, precise way of thinking. And if you want to be rigorous and precise, the best way to do it in is math. And basically the, the tools that you want to use, anything if you write formally, even if you had to write it formally, it wants to be as close to math as it can be. Because math is basically the best way we've got for learning how to think rigorously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what, what you're describing is actually captured nicely by a hypothesis that uh, came up in linguistic research. So there's this uh, Worf hypothesis that states that linguistic categories determine the way we think and we make decisions. So this really influences and shapes our reality. Um, and we actually have one of the listeners here who have question relating to that. So um, Edmund, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Thanks, Anna. And uh, thanks, Dr. Lamport. Um, yeah, previously, um, you'd mentioned in another interview, um, overcome, overcoming this wolf hypothesis in terms of effective communication uh, using mathematics. So I was just wondering, um, who were your favorite collaborators um, because of this, um, I guess, using maths um, keeping that central to your communication between you. So who are the favorite people that I've commun that yeah. I've worked with? That's the question. Uh, yeah. My favorite people I've worked with have been smart people. Uh, I've been very lucky to have been able to work with, you know, a whole bunch of them. Uh, sometimes the collaboration is, uh, uh, you know, well, for example, when working with Jim Gray, uh, you know, we wrote one paper together and Jim is, you know, was, you know, just an amazing system person, amazing understanding of systems. So I didn't work with Jim in order for him to, you know, so he could talk math with me. I work with him so he could, you know, have give the system insight and I can provide, could provide the the math. Uh, I mean, one of the th I'm one of the things I'm very good at is abstraction, and that's what math is all about: is abstraction. And I think I became good at abstraction because I was educated as a mathematician. And so, you know, Jim, for example, could provide you know wonderful insight into you know what's going on in 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 the system 
but I would have a better ability to abstract from that than he can. And that's, you know, so that's what makes a collaboration work well. The fact that, you know, different people bring different perspectives, different strengths to the collaboration. So whether I can, you know, talk in terms of, of formulas or not with somebody, well, you know, that depends on why I'm working with them and on what. I mean, math is not something, you know, oh, I've thought about math, you know, I've learned math, I've learned to think with math, therefore, you know, every time I write a line of code, I'm going to be thinking in math. You should, it's like, you know, building muscles. You know, you may not be using this muscle all the time, but, you know, sitting down at my desk, you know, I don't need my leg muscles, but if I need to do some running, I want that muscle to be strong. And it's the same way. You know, in writing code, I'm not thinking about math, but when I need to think mathematically, I want to have that brain muscle uh, strong so I can use it. So, um, what are programmers who don't think mathematically missing out, in your view? Well, they're missing out a tool. I mean, it's like saying, what is somebody, what are you missing out if you didn't know how to add? Well, it would be hard for me to tell you exactly what being able to add means to you. Or say if you're an accountant and you don't know how to add, but you know, well, you've got this adding machine and I could, you know, put plug numbers on it. But somehow it's clear to me that if you're an accountant and don't really understand how to add, I don't want to use you, even if you've got a really great editing machine. So, you know, I can't say, oh, you know, here's when, when you come to write this piece of code, not knowing math, is, you know, it's going to be a hindrance. Uh, this is something, a basic way of being able to think that people should, uh, should know. And the thing that's really hard to teach is even if you've learned the math, how to use it in practice. And it's something that mathematicians don't teach very well. Uh, it's a very, I mean, difficult problem. Uh, mathematician, mathematicians don't understand, you know, how to apply this math. And people, and most programmers, not knowing the math, don't understand how it will help them. And you know, I would really like help from educators and you know, to understand how to teach that. I, 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 no, I, 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 I think, yeah, perfectly get it. And uh, yeah, I'm thinking of my background where, yeah, it was math and math, 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 about 50% of all the courses we took in computer science were maths. And they just got you to think and reason in a particular way. And uh, if you don't have it, you know, you, you, you tend to go in and use libraries or use you know, reuse tools or use your counting machines um, instead of actually going in and creating your own and improving. I think a lot of us are already there. Um, we've got, uh, so if we look at recent years, programming and coding has turned into a um, collaborative team activity. Uh, uh, Daniel Craig, um, if you're there, could you mute yourself? You had a question in regards to uh, team settings. That's right. Um, Dr. Lamper, I wanted to ask you uh, what advice you have for raising the level of thought above the code in a team setting. Uh, of raising what? Could you repeat raising what you said? Of, yes. Raising the level of thought above the code level in a team setting. Well, teams, I mean, if you're building something, I mean, teams don't sit down and write code together. You know, you go to a, a meeting, it's not there so you can all sit in front of a terminal and, and type code. You're thinking about, you know, how you split things up, you know, what the larger picture is. So people, when you're in a team, you, need, you know that you need to think above the code. You need to understand, be able to split the code into pieces, which means, Everybody has to understand, you know, what some the code somebody else is writing is going to do without having to read the code. Because, you know, if you're writing too much code, there's, there's just going to be too much code in the system for even for one person to understand all of the code. So, 
It's not that we have to teach people to think above the, in a team setting, to think above the code. But what we need to do is learn to teach, to communicate uh, and think more precisely about what they're doing. And what found with TLA plus and, well, actually I saw this happening, uh, oh, 20, 30 years ago when I was just starting to develop TLA plus. And I was, uh, when looking for examples, I got a, a system that some people were building. And uh, so I asked them to, a couple of the people on that system to sit down and sort of explain what the system is doing so I could write a spec or what they were trying to do so I could write a specification of it. And when I just started, so I just, you know, asking these people to tell me what they, you know, asking questions about, well, what does this do? And in this situation, what happens? And just so I, you know, starting to write a spec. And I got to some point where someone said, oh, well, here it does this. And the other person said, no, in that case, it does, doesn't do this, it does this. The other person said, wait, wait, wait. And so they stopped what I've been doing, spent 20 minutes sitting at the whiteboard, figuring out, you know, what should it actually be doing? Now, if they hadn't been sitting down with me, they would both have gone off working on this, you know, their own little piece of this with basic misunderstanding of what something is doing. And that would have been a very big, it could have been a very big problem when they only discovered this after running the code and discovered that it, you know, doesn't work. Uh, and that was one, you know, experience. And I've been told by actually the people, uh, someone at Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure said that one of the, that writing a specification, one of the advantages, the reasons that they like writing a specifications in TLA plus is it allows them to be very precise about a very high level view of the system. So it aids, they all reach a common understanding of what they're doing. And that's basically what math gives you. It's a common language. And uh, people do not disagree on what, you know, the meaning of a formula is. You know, two plus two equals four, there's no, you know, there's no debate about what that means. So I have a question from Hillel Wayne, so who um, was not able to be here tonight, but um, he's forwarded on to us. And he was asking, so Hillel, um, he spoke about TLA Plus at CodeMesh last year. And his question is, um, uh, what way have you used math that's most surprised you that you, fi that you find it use that you actually found it useful? So given that uh, temporal logic is, uh, is a form of logic that was not uh, appreciated uh, probably enough um, uh, before introduction of uh, yeah, its application in um, computing. Okay. First of all, I'm telling you that the, one of the reasons why I think TLA is great because it uses very little temporal logic. Uh, a lot of things that have surprised me and helped me, but they're not in the things that come to my mind are not things that are of interest to programmers because they're more theoretical aspects. Uh, the nice thing about temporal logic about TLA is that if the, way, the reason you use uh, temporal logic in TLA is for specifying liveness. So I don't know if people understand the distinction between safety and liveness, but basically for safety, you do not need temporal logic. And engineers who think remote, you know, some engineers just basically use TLA plus almost always for just checking and specifying safety properties. And they don't, you know, use TLA, they don't use temporal logic at all. Uh, temporal logic is needed to, of course, it's the best way of thinking about liveness. And thinking about liveness is hard because liveness is a very you know, subtle issue and people find it hard. And I'm afraid sometimes they say, oh, this is hard because it's temporal logic. 
So it's not hard because it's temporal logic. The temporal logic is easy and, and not terribly, you know, just a nice way of, of expressing it. The hard stuff is the liveness. But uh, so I want to take TL, you know, temporal logic out of the equation. What have I found surprising in using math? Well, I'll, I'll, I don't know, I'll give you one example. Uh, there was uh, when the, the parser for TLA plus was being written, a person was writing it, asked me, there's, there's one thing that in TLA plus you can write a prime in, in, in a formula, but you're not allowed to write a double prime. Mm -hmm. So deciding whether or not you've written a double prime, it sounds like it's you know, really easy. So that's, so somebody asked, well, how do I really you know, do this? It, it's called level checking. You know, you know, level zero is no primes, level one is you know, one prime and you're not supposed to go to level two, that sort of thing. Uh, I thought level checking, that sounds really simple. So I was going to write an informal, you know, little paragraph, you know, uh, to explain what, what liveness checking or what level checking was. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, gee, that's not so simple. And finally, the, what I decided is I actually needed to write a, a TLA plus spec, and not using the temporal part of it, actually, it's just that, you know, TLA plus has, it contains inside of a language for math, and it was just the math part of it that, that was needed. And so I took me a while and I wrote this uh, precise mathematical uh, description of what, you know, what the algorithm has to compute and, and gave it to this person and he knew TLA plus, so he was able to do it. And, he was writing it in Java, and I asked him, uh, well, just curiosity, I mean, here's this thing, complete math, you know, formulas, nothing like any programming. Uh, how hard was it to, in, to put it into Java? And he said, it was completely straightforward. And later, when I actually had to modify the parser, because we modified the language, I looked at his code, and there you could see, I mean, my specification was there in comments, and you could see very precisely exactly where the Java code corresponded to, uh, to this math. And, you know, people will say, you know, well, I need to write code. What good is the math? Well, coding is something you're taught easily. You know, you should be coders. Coding shouldn't be a problem. The hard part of programming should be, you know, going from what needs to be computed or how it should be computed to the code. Of what I'm sorry, of what and how something should be should be computed, not how to code it. And in fact, and that was one of those cases where uh, you needed the math before it could write the code. Um, so uh, using this, uh, mathematical thinking is sometimes considered a daunting task for beginners. Um, what advice would you have for novices in the area? So, for example, what would be good algorithms or problems to exercise in order to strengthen this muscle that you were talking about previously? Well, all I could answer is that engineers who learn TLA plus and then using TLA plus, they, they learn the math that they're using because they have to use math. And that does help their mathematical thinking. And I wish there were uh, a faster approach. That is, you're not having to learn TLA plus and use the model checker to check what you're doing and everything. But uh, you know, I would like a more efficient way of teaching the math part of it. And you know, I don't know. I'm. I'm writing some things now that may be useful. Uh, and if they are, I'll put them on my website. But I don't have a magic, you know, as, as, uh, as a Ptolemy who, who, who said, you know, there's no royal road to mathematics. <laughs> and I don't know one. I think the material you're accumulating is uh, definitely useful and um, hopefully will guide more people um, towards the usage. Um, we have a follow-up question uh, from the audience. Um, Ron, can you ask your question? Yes. Uh, hi. Um, I think that uh, the secret to writing an effective specification of a system 
is uh, finding the right level of abstraction to describe it uh, and choosing which details to ignore. Uh, do you have any advice for beginners on how to do that? Boy, uh, I have a, I mean, my general advice to how beginners, you know, to write, write a specification, in writing a specification, you're uh, basically describing behaviors. A behavior is a sequence of, happens to be described as a sequence of states. And I tell people to just sit down and write a single behavior or at least the start, you know, the first half dozen steps of that, that states of that behavior. And doing that forces you to figure out, to choose a level of abstraction. Uh, and, but, you know, that sort of gets you to think about what the level of abstraction should be before you start getting involved into the details of writing the spec but how to go about choosing that right level. Uh, I mean, all I can give you is, you know, a nice platitude that says, you know, if you want it to be as simple and as most abstract as you can while still learning what you need to learn from it. But, you know, platitudes don't really help you, uh, you know, deal with real life problems. So, and, you know, I can't uh, give any magic formula. Okay, so um, I think we've got a final question, um, which uh, comes from both uh, Annette and I, and it's, you know, where do you think we'll be in, in 20 years? And how do we actually need to adjust the kind of uh, computer science curriculums uh, to achieve it? Well, uh, as the Danish proverbs goes, uh, prediction is always difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I have no special talent for that. One thing that I do believe is that uh, thanks to growth in AI, I expect that in some length of time, maybe 20 or 30 years, I'm not, you know, I can't predict, that some great majority of the stuff that programmers are now writing won't need programmers to, to write them. They'll be written automatically. And I see two possible directions that, the, that this can take, and it may take both of them, you know, in, in parallel. The unfortunate direction is that this will be done because um, the AI programs will take vague descriptions of what somebody is telling them to do and, you know, make a, a reasonable guess as to what it's going to do based on examples. And it will produce code that's just as bad as the code being produced now, except it's going to be cheaper to produce. Uh, the other direction, more hopeful one, is that what they'll be programs will be built from is not from uh, vague descriptions, but from very precise, high-level descriptions of what they're written in. And those descriptions will look a lot more like TLA plus than like C. And that all of these languages, these low level you know, languages, C, C++ and stuff, are, you know, you're not gonna get a job by you know, not knowing that stuff. You know, you're gonna get a good job, you know, interesting stuff by being able to think at this higher level. 